have a couple of announcements I'd like to make that just have to do with life here with the rhythm of the church and the family that is here. Uh, first of all, we will have um, a memorial service for Carolina Rosales uh, Friday. The visitation will be here in the sanctuary Friday at 10 o'clock. The, um, uh, the, the message will be from 11 to, to 11.30, message and music. And then we will have um, a fellowship meal, a potluck meal in the fellowship hall to uh, minister to Carolina's family who are traveling from out of town and also a time for us to just reflect and enjoy the life that God allowed us to be a witness to and to share. Um, Irene, so far, how many people have volunteered to provide food? So we will have one item to eat. I'm sorry? No. There's not a there's not a uh, a graveside service just right after the service here, which will be short. We'll have a fellowship lunch together. So, if you can provide a meal to minister to this family and to the rest of the church, if you can provide a dish, would you please uh, talk to um, Irene so that she she can organize what we have and what we don't have. Right after the worship service today, for those of you who would like to continue our little experiment in choir choral music to invite you to stay uh, um, and Patty has some instructions for you we'll meet um, so that people can fellowship let's just meet Patty you don't need an instrument do you to, for this meeting just can we just go in the green room we'll meet in the green room she can tell you what songs we're working on and and how we'll be doing some stuff so right after the worship service if you'll make your way to the green room um, that would be great It's a little book in the Bible I, I want us to turn our attentions to this morning for a few moments. It's a strange little book that's different from the others in the New Testament and, and, and the others in the Old Testament as well. It's the book of, uh, some pronounce it Philemon. I'll go with that, how I was raised. Philemon. It's, it's different. One reason is because how short it is. Of course, there's only one chapter. So they, they don't even give a, a chapter, it's just verses. And the other thing is it's it's a personal letter rather than a doctrinal thesis or a word of correction to a church. It's a personal letter from Paul to a person. Now there, however, it's in the scriptures because there is a great deal for us to learn. I just want us to look uh, this morning at two of the verses here in Philemon. That's verse 10 and 11. Paul is the author writing to Philemon, and he says, I feel appeal to you for my child Onesimus, whose father I became in my imprisonment. Formerly he was useless to you, but now he is indeed useful to you and to me. Now, when you read the entire book of Philemon, you kind of you get a story, and you're putting together some other pieces of information just from the context of that age. And so what we know is that Philemon has a bond servant named Onesimus. The name Onesimus means useful. And this bond servant fled. And evidently Paul met him in prison. And Paul shared the gospel of Jesus, as I'm sure he shared with every prisoner who came within five yards of him. And Philemon accepted Christ, and there was a transformation that took place. He was changed dramatically. And now Paul is writing to this man that had been Philemon, had been Onesimus' uh, uh, master. And this man happens to be a fellow servant of Paul's. He is, he is a leader in the kingdom of God and the move of God. And Paul is writing on behalf of Onesimus. So that's kind of the story in the background. Here's something uh, that we get from this. First of all, Onesimus was a bond servant. That means he volunteered. He's a volunteer. Now, 
it's a little bit stricter than volunteer. It's a little more like when I volunteered to join the military, I became a bond servant for six years. Well, I had to do what they told me to do. I had to wear what they told me to wear. I had to go where they told me to go. But I was a volunteer. And there's many reasons why a person might put themselves in bond servant today and in those days. A person may join the military because they want to get a college education. A person may join, uh, in my case, because it was what we called three hots and a cot. I knew no matter how much I messed things up, I was definitely going to have three hot meals and a bed to sleep in. And so that was, I, I made myself a bond servant to the United States government. Onesimus has made himself a bond servant, but he is a useless bond servant. And in fact, he chooses to run away. He chooses uh, to abandon his post and his position. He didn't have Canada to run to, so he ran to Rome or wherever he went to. He ends up in prison. Maybe it was, maybe he went to Ephesus, but he ends up with, in prison with Paul. Before Christ, Onesimus was useless to his master. And worse than useless, he was a criminal. Romans chapter 3, verse 10 through 12, if you'll turn to Romans 3, verses 10 through 12. The same Paul is writing down the commentary. He's quoting God, God's commentary on you and me. As it is written, none is righteous, no, not one. No one understands. No one seeks God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good. Not even one. Before Christ, we were the useless ones. We were the Onesimus that, didn't, that the name didn't match according to God. Before Christ, we were worthless to him. And we should have been in service to the creator who created us, but we were not. We ran away. Now, what happened after Christ with Onesimus is he has a transformation, and although he is not a bondservant to Paul, he's not legally bound to Paul, he finds himself of being great value in the service to God, to Paul. Just This is just who he is now. Do you see that? And in fact, Paul says, I hate to part with him. He's such a wonderful guy. He helps me so much, but his rightful place is with you. And when he gets back and you see him, I want him to be valuable to you the way that he is to me. Do you see the transformation there? And so he sends Onesimus back as a bondservant. But Paul says to Philemon, not only will you receive him as a servant, but he is so much more than that now. In fact, Paul says, I have become his father. Not only does our attitude and our makeup change when we receive Christ as Savior, but our position changes as well. In John chapter 15, John chapter 15, verse 15, Jesus speaking to the eleven says this, No longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends. For all that I have heard from my father, I have made known to you. So we see back, back in this book of Philemon, verse 15 and 16, notice what Paul says about Philemon. He says, for this is perhaps 
why he was parted from you for a while, that you might have him back forever, no longer as a bondservant, but more than a bondservant, as a beloved, as a beloved brother, especially to me, but how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. The transformation not only takes place in who Philemon is, he no longer is useless, but he has become useful, but the transformation also takes place in his position among his brothers and his position with God himself. And that brings us to another passage of Scripture that has to deal with servants in the kingdom of God. I find it interesting that that, uh, Patrick had this in his Sunday school class. He and I don't collaborate, and this morning it's also in the message. So perhaps God is wanting to say something to you from this passage of Scripture in Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12. Starting in verse 35, Jesus is speaking. And he's speaking to the twelve. And he says, Stay dressed for action and keep your lamps burning, and be like men who are waiting for their master to come home from the wedding feast, so that they may open the door to him at once when he comes and knocks. Blessed are those servants whom the master finds awake, When he comes, truly I say to you, he, he, meaning the master, will dress himself for service and have them recline at the table, and he, meaning the master, will come and serve them. If he comes in the second watch or in the third watch and finds them awake, blessed are those servants. First of all, he's saying there are servants that are faithful. I have placed them I've given them jobs to do, and they are faithful. And blessed is that servant, because when I come, I will prepare a wedding feast for them, and they will sit at the table, and they will be rewarded for their faithful service to me. And he says in verse um, 38, If he comes in the second watch, or the third, and finds them awake, blessed are those servants, but know this, that if the master of the house had known at what hour the thief was coming, he would not have left his house to be broken into. And you also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming in an hour and you do not expect. So when he says the master of the house, now he's not talking about the master that went away. He's talking about the master that he put in charge of the house. He's talking about the chief butler. So the story goes like this. The kingdom of God is like this. A man goes away and he leaves someone in charge of the house. He gives him responsibility. And he needs to be ready and watching for the master's return. The butler needs to be there ready to answer the door. He needs to be waiting and serving no matter how late the master is. And if the master comes and finds him and the other servants doing well, he'll have a banquet for them. They will receive their reward. If he does not find them doing well, however, things are not going to go well for them. Now, I find it interesting that as soon as Jesus starts talking about a master of the house that is not the ultimate master, Peter comes up in verse 41. Lord, are you telling this parable for us or for all? In other words, Lord, um, am I the butler? Lord, are you telling this to the eleven? Because you said something about thrones earlier. You've talked about right hand and left hand in other places. Now you're talking about a chief servant. Are you talking about us or someone else? And I love Jesus' answer. Because he doesn't say, yes, Peter, I'm talking about you. He doesn't say that. Here's his answer. Basically, his answer goes like this. It's up to you, Peter, who I'm talking about. Watch, verse 42. And the Lord said, Who then is the faithful and wise manager? Whom his master will set over his household to give them their portion of food at the proper time. Blessed is that servant whom his master will find so doing when he comes. Truly I say to you, he will set him over all his possessions. But if that servant says to himself, My master is delayed in coming 
and begins to beat the male and female servants and to eat and drink and get drunk, the master of that servant will come on a day that he does not expect him and an hour he does not know and will cut him in pieces and put him with the unlawful. And that servant who knew his master's will but did not get ready or act according to his will receive, will receive a severe beating. But the one who did know and did what deserved the, I'm sorry, the one who did not know and did what deserved a beating will receive a light beating. And here we go, ready? Everyone to whom much is given, of him much is required. And from him to whom they entrusted much, they will demand more. Peter, it's going to be up to you whether or not you're the one I put in charge. It will depend on how you handle the things that I give you to do. If you do well with them, Peter, if you are a useful servant, then I will demand that you are faithful with even more things. However, if you are useless, then you will receive punishment. In another place he says, and what little you even have been given will be taken away. So here we have, in the book of Philemon, this thing about a servant that was useless, but when he was born again, he suddenly just naturally began doing service. And he's taken from the position of runaway slave criminal, and now he's called son of Paul, friend and brother to Philemon. And he goes back to Philemon to serve in the kingdom of God next to Philemon. Let me just talk to you for a moment about a very basic construct in God's kingdom that you need to understand. This is just the way he made things. He made people to rule over various items or territories. That's just the way he did it. Did he have to do that? No, it was his great pleasure to do that. When he created everything, he just said, you know what I think would be fun? I think it would be fun instead of me running everything, I'm going to have some other people run some stuff for me, my way, as if I had done it. I think I'd like to have children. I think I'd like to have sons and daughters. I think I'd like my children involved in the family business. I'd like them to meet together with me at the breakfast table and we'll talk over the duties of the day. I'd like to have them involved. I'd like to have them asking me for help and asking me for direction, and together we will rule my creation. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, first of all. Genesis 1, 26. Then God said, Genesis 1, 26. Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Now, there has been a great deal of, de of debate. What does that mean, being made in the image of God? Is it because he's triune and man is body, soul, and spirit, so he's triune? Is that what it means? Or does it mean that man has the ability to love and God has the ability to love? Is that what it means? Or does it mean that man is self-aware, that he is, has personhood? Is that what it means, that he's like God in the matter that he's self-aware? The passage itself tells you what it means to be created in the likeness of God. And, and just about any Jewish person would be able to tell you what it means to be created in the image of God. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heaven and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. This is before the fall and this was the plan of God. I will create man and he will have dominion over that portion of my creation that I give to him. Now, if he's faithful in that, but if he's unfaithful, things are going to go real bad, real fast. Was man faithful in it or unfaithful? Broke the laws right away. He was unfaithful. Psalms chapter 8. Psalms chapter 8.
And I, I don't want you folks to get bored. We are building a foundation because there is a message for you today. So don't, don't drop off the radar here. There's a message. Psalms, Psalms chapter 8, verses 3 through 9. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you care for him? You have given him dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, all the beasts of the bear of the field, the birds of the heavens, the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the sea. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. This was God's intent. This is how he wanted to do things. If God wants to make the sky blue instead of red, guess what? He gets to make it blue. And if he decides that he wants to give human beings authority and responsibility in his kingdom, guess what? He gets to do that. And that brings us to last week's passage of Scripture that we looked at, Psalms chapter 2. Would you turn there, please? And I would like to remind you that in Psalms chapter 2, we saw that it was broken down into four stanzas, four parts. The first part was the nations and the kings and the rulers having their say. They're raging against God and against his anointed one. The second part was God having his say. He says that he terrifies them in his wrath. He rebukes them and terrifies them in his wrath and in his fury. That's God having his say. And the third stanza, suddenly someone else is talking. And what does that third person say? He says, I will tell of the decree. The Lord said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will make the nations your heritage, the ends of the earth your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron and dash them in pieces like potter's vessel. The question comes up, who is this third person who is talking? Because he's saying, God has said something to me. Who is this third person that is talking? Well, First of all, we know that the third person who is talking is Jesus Christ himself. All of the nations will be given to him as an inheritance. And we saw last week in the book of Acts that the apostles quote this passage of Scripture saying, this is talking about Jesus. But in addition, we see that this passage of Scripture is talking about David, or maybe even more so about Solomon, because God placed David and Solomon over an empire there in the Middle East. It wasn't the entire planet. It's smaller than Jesus' empire. But Solomon in particular, God said, I showed you last week, God said, and, and your son Solomon, I will call him my son. But there's someone else that this is talking about. And that's you. There was a day not every day of your life, but there was a day, there was a day somewhere in your past where you heard the gospel message. And when you heard the gospel message, just like Onesimus, your heart broke, your knees bent, and you cried out to God and said, God save me. That day was today when God says, I have called you my son. And he gave you a territory to rule. Not as big as David's. Not like Jesus's. But a territory nonetheless. On that day, God called it today. I declare, you are my son. And I'm giving you some responsibilities as my son. The book of Luke tells us you have to do something with those responsibilities. You are either, either the faithful and wise servant or you are not. And so that brings us now once again 
to the verse of this year, would you turn to Hosea chapter 10? The verse of the year is Hosea chapter 10, verse 12. We're going to read verses 12 through 15 and get some context going here. Hosea chapter 10, verses 12 through 15. So for yourselves righteousness. I, I could pause right there and say, I will declare the decree of the Lord. He said to me, Today you have become my son. Today I have made you my son. So for yourself, seeds of righteousness. Reap steadfast love. Break up your fallow ground, for it is time to seek the Lord that he may come and rain righteousness upon you. Do you see that? If I am faithful to sow righteousness, what does he do? He responds by raining. He who is given little, if he is faithful with what little has been given to him, what will the Lord do? Give him much. And he who is given little, little and is unfaithful with it, what will the Lord do? Take away even what little he has been given. In fact, it goes on to say in verse 13, listen, church, you have plowed iniquity and you have reaped injustice. They plowed sin. Some of the sins that that people, it's not an individual here, he's talking to a nation. Some of the sins that that nation plowed was, of course, they were idolaters. They went after foreign gods. They were gluttons. They were... Uh, they sold widows' children into slavery for a dollar. That was the iniquity. What did they reap when God wiped out their country? He sold their children into slavery. There's this cry of the Lord saying, Look, I love you. Stop what you're doing because you reap what you sow. You have eaten the fruit of lies because you have trusted in your own way and in the multitude of your warriors. Therefore, the tumult of war shall arise among your people and all your fortresses shall be destroyed as Shalman destroyed Beth Farbel on the day of battle. Mothers were dashed in pieces with their children. Thus it shall be done to you. O Bethel, because of your great evil at dawn, the king of Israel shall be utterly cut off. Now here the king of Israel had been told in Psalms chapter 2, I will make the nations your inheritance. And here the king of Israel, it says, at dawn, the king will be shut, will be cut off. So now let me just talk to you in a very practical, very uncomfortable, face-to-face -face sense. Father has declared you as his son and has given you a territory to rule. I would like to talk to you about that territory for a moment. First of all, it's right here. Always, you know, people always wonder, hey, how come God doesn't give me something bigger to do? And what did you do with this? The scriptures tell you the way the Lord wants you to live this life. He does not want you doing the things that the pagans do. He does not want you looking upon the things that they look upon. He does not want you to take in the things that they take in. He does want you to live by the word of God and to read the word of God. He doesn't want you to be a person that can binge watch all of the Friends episodes in one weekend, but he does want you to be a people who will spend hours in prayer. He gave you that to rule, and he's not going to rule it for you. It is yours, your responsibility. Blessed is the servant 
when the master comes to the household. See, we're wondering, Peter's going, are you going to put me over everybody? Peter, how about you just be over you for a minute? How are you living? What are you sowing? He has made you Lord over your time, over the minutes and the hours of your day. You have lordship over that, and no one else is going to manage that for you. What are you doing with your time? Where do you invest it? Where do you sow your minutes and your hours so seeds of righteousness. Before harvest time comes, because you will reap what you sow. He has made you Lord over your finances. You have been given lordship over your dollars and your pennies and your nickels. How have you ruled them? Where have you spent them? Or do they spend you? There's a passage in the scriptures, I think it's 1 Corinthians 13, where Paul quotes a saying that the church said to him. It was a Greek saying that, that they were quoting to him. And it goes like this, the stomach for food, the food for stomach. That, that's not a biblical passage. That's, they were saying to him, look, we're eating. We're going to eat because after all, the stomach for food and the food for stomach. And Paul quotes it back to him and says, and God will destroy them both. What, what are you doing with your health? He has made you Lord over this body. What are you eating? Well, that's such a simple thing, Pastor. And, and don't I have freedom? Oh, absolutely. Nobody's going to rule it for you, but you, you sow the wind, you reap the whirlwind. He has made you. He has given you dominion over how you treat this and what you do with it. Because after all, according to Romans chapter 12, this is to be offered to him as a living sacrifice. People go, I'm ready to die for him. Okay, great, but are you ready to live for him? And in the living for him, how, what does that mean? Taking ownership of this, being a steward over it for him. You'll notice that God gave Adam one garden, and he was supposed to tend that garden and to have children who would tend other gardens until the Garden of Eden conquered the world. You have been given a garden. And if, can you imagine, just in this church, if every one of us sowed seed of righteousness in the dominion that he has given us, if we each tended this garden, and each of us lives in a different neighborhood, do you recognize how the light of Jesus Christ would shine in the city? But what have we done? We live like everyone else. We pursue their entertainment. We're investing our time in their nonsense and their never-ending talking heads. Fathers, he has given you responsibility over your children. Not for your glory, but for their benefit and his glory. Mothers, he's given you responsibility towards your husband and your children and your homes. Can we just rule what he has given us faithfully? Listen, you can say, Pastor, I'm, I'm not sure. That's what the word of God is for. I don't know for sure how to do my finances. Guess what? It's all written down. And you have teachers here who have been teaching for years. 
of how God says we're to deal with our finances. I'm not sure how I'm supposed to deal with my time, Pastor. It's all written down in the Word. I don't know how to be a father. It is written. I don't know how to deal with my body. It is written. Vista Hill. Could we take stock Maybe, as Frank said, take inventory of the store, the little, the little tiny store that you've been given. Could we take stock of that and start ruling it his way? We say that we want Jesus Christ to be the king of the world. Do you understand the way he becomes king right now, in our time, right now? is by ruling through you over your little dominion. Which brings me to this. Ask him for help. First of all, devote yourself. Like Onesimus, you've got to go home. You you were a volunteer. Maybe you wanted three hots and a cot. Maybe you wanted a college degree. You wanted something from God. You were just a volunteer, but you're not a volunteer anymore. You are now a child of the household of God. you got to go home. But Father, here I am. What would you have me do? Well, I'd like you to start with your body, with your time, with your finances. How about this? with your relationships. Father, I just don't know if I can forgive. I have given you dominion over your relationships. And I have told you my will is for you to forgive. I don't know if I can turn the other cheek. I have given you dominion. And I have written in my scriptures my will As you rule yourself, you turn the other cheek. I don't know if I can set others first. I have given you dominion and responsibility. And I have written in my word that you are to consider others before yourself. I don't know if I can serve my neighbor. I have given you dominion and a territory. And I have said in my word, my will is for you to take care of those around you. The call this year in sowing seeds of righteousness, as we heard on the very first Sunday of the year, Vista Hills. We have to change. We have to put on the long pants. We have to take our responsibilities and do them. When he comes, he will come with his reward. Or not. It's up to you. What did you hear this morning? We have a reward coming, but we make the choice now, and it is eternal. What else did you hear? Tina? Accountable to him. Amen. As children of God, we are accountable to him. What else did you hear? Take responsibility over your actions. What else did you hear? It's a daily effort. It's a daily effort. What else did you hear? It's not about me. It's about him. Anything else? Where will you find the instructions to rule the territory he has given you? 
in the word, how dare you, how dare you think you're going to live this life faithfully to him without knowing what his word says. Let's pray. Well, Father, thank you that you gave us, that you <laughs> spoke to us. Through your word, you tell us that we are your children, and you tell us that you have things that you've put us in charge of. Each one of us is in charge of something. Thank you that you didn't just leave us unaware, but that then you, you tell us, hey, let's, let's do this. Get up, children. Let's work. Thank you for that. Oh, Father, I want to ask in the name of your son, Jesus, that you would give us courage, that you would stir our hearts, that we would obey your commands, we would break up the fallow ground, and that we would live outrageously the Christian life as described in the scriptures. In Jesus' name, amen.